get have the the pleasure of hosting the Laura Mann uh, Integrative Health Lecture Series. And I would like to just give a brief intro for those who maybe haven't heard it before about the Laura Mann um, uh, Lecture Series and who Laura Mann was. Laura Mann was a home birth nurse midwife who served her patients with great compassion and love. She was a visionary, and after receiving a stage four breast cancer diagnosis, she was inspired to build the first um, center in the Burlington, Vermont area devoted to promoting, promoting the benefits of integrative health care. And we honor Laura's legacy through the endowed Laura Mann Integrative Health Care Lecture Series. And each year, three distinguished integrative health care leaders or panels of leaders are invited to share best practices, the latest research and innovations in the field. And I really wanna thank you, Kara, for um, letting us host some of these in, in Family Medicine Grand Rounds. Also, we have a panel of speakers today, and I'm just gonna give a brief background of these uh, speakers. We have Christine Vadovec, who's a PhD, um, from Gund Institute for Environment and, and Gund Institute for the Environment Fellow and the OSHA affiliate leading our planetary health arm and hosts a panel of UVM health network experts to discuss climate related health needs. They'll be talking about how to talk about the climate with patients and healthcare options that are better for the planet. Other panel members are Kim Dittis, MD, PhD, and Director of Integrative Oncology Clinical Services, an Associate Professor at Lerner College of Medicine and uh, Faculty in Medicine, Hematology, and Oncology. Megan Malgieri, MD, um, as was with UVM for well over a decade and as an Assistant Professor in Family Medicine and now working in private practice locally. And we have David Rand, DO, Assistant Professor in Internal Medicine, and Andrew Rosenfeld, MD, Associate Professor in Psychiatry and Pediatrics. And with that, I will let our panel speakers take it away. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Whitney, for a lovely introduction. And thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all. And I have to say, an honor to be working with this wonderful group of panelists. Thanks to Kara Feldman Hunt for suggesting that we have a panel and bringing us together. We really appreciate having this opportunity. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. And we're going to dive right in because we have a lot of information we'd like to share with people. Um, so we're going to be focusing, this is a planetary health panel, but we're really going to be focusing on climate change today. I just want to say three brief reasons why climate change in particular is at the top of our um, heads for thinking about planetary health. The first reason is that in the fall of 2021, amidst the um, height of the COVID pandemic, over 200 of the leading medical journals worldwide released a joint statement saying that climate change is the number one public health threat that humanity faces. So this included JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine and the British Medical Journal and the Lancet um, and really all of the top quality medical journals came out saying we need to do something about climate change because we're seeing this in our clinics. We're seeing this in the health of our communities. The second reason climate change is important for us to all think about is because in repeated polls, national polls, we're seeing that healthcare providers, number one nurses, followed closely by physicians as number two, are consistently rated as the most trusted sources of information about climate change. So we need to make sure that everybody is aware of how to talk about climate change and how climate is affecting health right now and continue in the future. The third reason is that even though we know climate change is really important, we know that it's affecting health, <clears throat> only 18% of medical schools currently include climate change in their curriculum. And in many of those places, uh, climate change is an elective course um, and not everyone is having access to learn about climate change through their medical education. 
This is important because we need our clinicians to both understand these connections, but we also need everyone to feel confident and in the knowledge that they have and confident in how to communicate effectively with their patients when you see someone coming into the clinic. So that's why we're gonna focus on climate change. And we're gonna start here. Um, the panel has graciously allowed me to take a few minutes in the beginning to give an overview, to set the stage. And then each person will have a few minutes to speak from their particular area of expertise. And then we'll open it up for um, a larger question and answer period and discussion amongst everyone. So we're gonna start here with just what, how is climate change affecting Vermont right now? And as you see here, really what we're thinking about is that <clears throat> right now we're already experiencing increased temperatures over the course of the year. Summers are two degrees warmer, winters are four degrees warmer than compared to 1960s. Um, spring comes earlier, winter starts later, so our summer season has extended and um, we've gotten a lot more precipitation. And that's going to continue. We're expecting to see up until at least 2100 is as far as the predictions that we have. Looking out specifically, we're going to continue to see these warmer, wetter periods of time here in Vermont. I'm going to point you all to this resource, which is um, the white paper that our Department of Health released back in 2017. And it really dives in specifically to these key areas where we are already seeing change and um, specifically the health-related effects of these changes. I'm going to very briefly cover each of these pieces here um, just to get a broad sense and get that conversation started. Um, but know that there are many resources right here on the Department of Health website, including this white paper that goes into a lot of detail and more information that we're happy to share with you. So in general, for thinking about heat in Vermont, the magic number is 87 degrees Fahrenheit. So in other places around the country, you might expect that 87 doesn't feel that warm, um, but here, it's when we hit 87 that we're starting to see um, increased number of hospital visits coming into the emergency room for heat related illness. And we're going to continue to see this number of days overall increasing. So we're expecting to see more heat related illness. We need to be educating people about heat, about humidity, about how to take breaks, to drink a lot of water, all those different things to make sure that heat does not become um, a real health concern here in the state. For extreme weather, of course, we've seen repeatedly now, um, especially over the summer, these extreme precipitation events. And again, we're just going to be seeing more of these events over the next century. Um, we're going to be seeing these three inches or more of rain um, every two to three years by the year 2100. And these are specifically really related to health, both through those acute injuries that are occurring, but then the longer term concerns about exposure to um, contaminating water and debris for both the people who are living in places, but also for these volunteers, like our amazing community efforts that happened over the summer with people going out and trying to help and the exposures that they might face. And then the longer term concern about mold and its connections to respiratory health. Foodborne and waterborne pathogens, this is similarly related to um, a combination of warmer temperatures, but also those more frequent rain events, which will lead to combined sewer overflows, agricultural runoff, that then introduces different pathogens into when drinking water, particularly well water. The Department of Health has a lot of um, information about E. coli spikes within you know, a day or two after a large rain event. We'll see the E. coli spike within well water. Um, recreational water, of course, is going to be impacted as well. And then irrigation. So any water that is coming across the fields, like we saw over the summer, the concern for contamination of all those crops, both with pathogens, but also with um, heavy metals and different types of toxins as well. This is one of those images from the Department of Health. And really what we're looking at here is just the trend in terms of when we have a large precipitation event, 
the darker the color, the more water is coming down, the more we see the E. coli in our private well water, in our recreational water, and the public drinking water continues to be safe overall, but you still see that increasing trend. Cyanobacteria, of course, is something that we've been seeing more and more of. It also occurs because of those warmer temperatures, more frequent rain, leading more agricultural runoff and nutrients into our waterways, just creates those conditions by which cyanobacteria blooms can form. Vectors, we're seeing, <clears throat> because of those warmer temperatures, those shorter winters, we're seeing increased ability for Black-legged ticks in particular, which are the tick in our state that carry diseases, they can flourish more, right? We need um, very cold conditions over the winter to limit their spread, to kill them off, uh, and we're just not seeing that anymore. This is why we're seeing this increased uh, prevalence of um, ticks and increased prevalence of Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and a few other newer diseases that are being tracked now by the Department of Health. Similarly, for mosquito-borne illnesses, we're seeing increases in West Nile and Triple E, um, again, because there's just more capability for the mosquitoes to survive here than previous times. This is a kind of busy graph, but it's just a little bit of that evidence for the number of cases that are reported in Vermont for Lyme disease. And we're just looking at the trend here seen back in 2005, we maybe weren't as capable at diagnosing, but also um, just in general, the trends are increasing so that now um, we have more than 1300 cases in 2022, which is the most recent data available. Air quality, of course, we saw this over the summer with wildfire smoke um, coming down from Canada and knowing that this is going to directly impact our respiratory well-being, and that we're going to continue to see this with changing weather patterns, changing wind patterns, um, and increased prevalence of wildfires from different areas around the country bringing that smoke to us. We also have the concern for air quality thinking about uh, pollen levels and allergy and looking at how pollen counts increase with more carbon dioxide in the air plus the fact that we have that longer growing season, three weeks longer than in 1960, we're just gonna have more plant growth, more pollen, um, and therefore expect to see more allergies, more respiratory health complaints. And of course, all of these things are related to mental health in particular. Um, we're seeing lots of terms being passed around now, like climate-related anxiety and solastalgia, and just these overall concerns that anyone can be affected by this. Just seeing this consistent news about climate change can cause depression, can like really lead us to be concerned about our own futures. Um, but also for people who are directly impacted by flooding or Lyme disease, for example, these folks are definitely going to have some, some mental health impacts that we need to be aware of. So what role does healthcare play in climate change? And this is really kind of two sides of the coin, right? I'll share a little bit briefly, just overview of um, how healthcare itself contributes to climate change, but also that we are this leading, we have a leading opportunity to allow us to become a, a source of information for the public to help educate people um, and to help think about different ways of thinking about health in general to help us overcome these concerns and help us really respond to climate change in different ways through both mitigation and adaptation. So you've probably seen me see, show this slide before, um, just showing that here's the impact that healthcare has on climate change. Um, globally, 5% of all climate emissions are from healthcare. In the US, 8.5% of all of our national emissions are from healthcare. 82% of those, so the, the number one scope of the healthcare emissions are coming from supply chains, and in particular, pharmaceuticals, which account for 10%. They're the number one um, source of that 8.5% of our national emissions. And so in thinking about our role, we can really think about what can we do to 
promote health, right? Connecting us to the Laura Mann series here of integrative, integrative health thinking. Um, what can we do that will keep people healthy so that they don't have to come into healthcare? They don't have to come into the hospital. Um, they don't have to use pharmaceuticals. What are those things that we can do to promote health? So there's really this critical need for us to identify new approaches for healthcare that will improve planetary health outcomes. There's an ethical imperative here for us to really consider these impacts. How do we keep people out of the healthcare system? Um, how do we integrate those practices that we already know um, have great evidence behind them that will support health and also have this co-benefit of decreasing our carbon footprint? Um, one of the key areas that I like to talk about is this 3450 campaign. It started with the American Public Health Association, and it's really about health promotion, right? That we have these three behaviors that lead to the four diseases that cause 50% of deaths. That also means that these three behaviors and four diseases are going to account to close to 50% of the carbon footprint. So if we can help make sure that people have access to um, physical movement, physical activity, healthy diets, and decreased use of tobacco, we're going to be setting up our community for a healthier lifespan, but also for decreased hospital utilization. Um, some of those integrative health tools that we know work really well, and there's a lot of great evidence, is just nutrition, right? Counseling people to think about nutrition, movement prescriptions, how to help people manage their stress and sleep better, um, making sure people have access to and perhaps um, prescriptions for getting out into nature. Number of different studies, and I'm happy to share that evidence with you um, at a different time when we have more time to talk about those things. But in general, we know that when we have these tools in place through primary care in particular and family medicine, we're going to increase health promotion, lower rates of disease overall, thinking back to that 3450 campaign. And then those potential co-benefits from things like plant-based diets, when you have a stronger focus on eating plants compared to meat, lower carbon footprint. When you bike to work or walk to school, you're going to have a decreased carbon footprint plus the benefit of those cardiovascular benefits from walking, for example. And then again, just that idea that these practices can help us lower that healthcare footprint. And on the flip side, when someone has become ill, there's a number of different evidence-based tools that are available to us that we know can help support care and help return someone to a healthier state and help them improve quality of life. And again, we're going to have those better outcomes, decreased demand for healthcare in general, decreasing that footprint, decreased length of stay in our healthcare facilities. So with that, thank you for listening to me for a few minutes, setting us up. And I've asked our panelists three questions ahead of time to kind of think about. And we're going to turn it right over to Dr. Rosenfeld. And I'm going to continue to share the screen because he has sent me some of his slides. So Dr. Rosenfeld, whenever you are ready. I am ready. Thank you, Christine. Can you hear me OK? Awesome. Many thumbs up. But, um, good morning. It's a delight to be here. I feel very at home uh, with your department. I was thinking I'm, my training is in psychiatry, which is part of why I asked Christine if maybe I could go first, because if you're not feeling it, I am. After all those statistics, a little climate anxiety. I also specialize in child and adolescent psychiatry. And after some years of practice, have started calling myself a family psychiatrist because the family system is really what we work with and kind of try to center in our work. And actually just recently, I realized there's a better term for what I do that's out there in the literature, which is emotional support animal. So that's now what I say that I do with families and when I'm being a good dad or a good husband or in my other roles. So I thought we could start a little bit by just talking about what is climate anxiety. As Christy mentioned, it sometimes goes by other names like eco-anxiety, and this definition from Sarah Lowe's work is, I think, pretty straightforward, distress about climate change and its impacts on the landscape and human existence. 
And like other anxiety problems, it shows up in the typical ways across our thoughts and feelings and behaviors, maybe intrusive thoughts about where are my children going to live or is my home going to flood or how are we going to deal with this? That can be quite intense and overwhelming. There can be physical stress and distress associated with it throughout body systems and avoidance behaviors. Uh, maybe not watching the news, maybe not going to the lake anymore because of the cyanobacteria blooms or um, avoiding talking with people who are concerned or avoiding learning about the climate crisis. I did want to be clear, this is not a, we have the DSM Diagnostic Statistical Manual that lists all of our diagnostic entities in psychiatry. This has not reached that status yet, so it's not something we can diagnose people with. On the other hand, I think we see it a lot coming into our clinics and especially in the younger generations. I mean, we're all affected by this, but I think kids and teens and 20-somethings are really feeling it because they're thinking maybe a little more longitudinally about their future and hearing these statistics about the 2050s and 2070s, and that feels like right square in the middle of their good lives. Um, so I'm seeing it in the office and then like other systemic problems, sometimes it's there and we don't know it. So I think raising awareness is helpful so that we can ask about it and sometimes realize that might be a, a driver of distress, even if it's not brought up in the appointment, because people don't know whether it's safe to talk about it. And I'll, I'll come back to this, but I wanted to talk about um, how can we break this down? Because we as physicians, healthcare providers, nurses, hospital personnel, administrators, leaders, et cetera, scientists, researchers might have this ourselves. So how do we talk about it with patients and families when we might also be a little overwhelmed? I think the first step is awareness. So in terms of um, learning about what's going on, thank you for coming. You're already digging into that step by listening to what Christine described, and by expanding your understanding of what's going on with the climate, what's going well, what's not going well, what are solutions, what are concerns, and how can we be a part of that? And the second step in terms of empowerment, I wanted to circle back to what Christine said, people really trust their doctors. There is a brilliant survey that looked at different political groups and who they trust about this particular topic, getting information on global warming. And if we look at, at one end of the spectrum, we have conservative Republicans. And for most of the groups, family and friends are at the top. But for conservative Republicans in particular, right after family and friends comes primary care providers, beating out NASA and Fox News. So it's a lot of trust that we have for providing information about global warming. And I think a big opportunity from the position of sort of scientific responsibility that physicians and other primary care providers hold. So in terms of empowerment, I think we have some room to do something. And as Christine talked about, we're in a system. So part of the awareness is not just how climate change and climate anxiety affects health, but also how our healthcare system and the sort of more industrial aspects of it in turn are contributing to global warming and climate change. So knowing it from both sides, I think raises our awareness, helps us to have impact both in the organizations we're a part of, as well as with the patients and families we serve. And the in other studies, uh, youth, this was studies from um, college and graduate students who had a significant degree of climate anxiety. It led to clinical depression only in those who were not involved in collective climate action. So actually, climate action is protective against the more depressogenic or uh, mental illness side of climate anxiety because it gives us something to do, it helps us feel empowered, it helps us build relationships, and it helps us make change. So that's a lot to ask. How, how, what am I gonna do about the climate? Is this even my job? As I titled the slide, maybe I'm doing really good healthcare. Can't somebody else fix the, the planet? Um, so I wanna then take a few minutes to talk about different actions that might be useful on the next slide, I think. And there's a lot to do. Um, the quote I put to, to slow myself down, if we would just slow down, happiness would catch up to us. And I think in some ways it's not about doing more and putting more into our schedules or plans or our patients and family schedules and plans, but actually taking a step back to think about how we prioritize things to shift some emphasis on climate protective interventions. So I listed a few, I'll try and touch on each one and probably much more could be said about all of them. The first I described as mindful prescribing and deprescribing. 
So a study out of the UK showed that about 10% of prescriptions that are given are unnecessary for various reasons. Maybe they're not being filled. Maybe it's the wrong dose. Maybe it's not clinically indicated. Maybe there are non-pharmacologic interventions that could be put into place instead of or alongside the pharmacologic interventions. And pills pack a pretty big climate punch in terms of being carbon heavy to produce. And then many of them end up polluting the environment. So by being mindful and potentially reducing or being smart about our prescribing, we can have an impact on the climate in multiple ways. How do we do that? Some of it is including the integrative approaches, which I'll touch on as well. Some of it is also where we place it in um, the, the, sch the scheme or scope of our work. So if somebody comes in for, let's say, a 30-minute visit, if we spend 20 minutes talking about diagnostic problems and the medications to treat them, and then on the way out the door, we say, by the way, you should get some exercise and maybe think about your diet, then people are going to know where our priorities are. It's about medications and diagnoses, and we're incentivized that way. That's what we can bill for most easily, and that's how we're kind of trained we can flip that equation and say, we'll get to the medicines and the diagnoses, but tell me about when was the last time you went outside? Tell me about what you had for breakfast this morning. What's your food access like? Tell me about how you got here. Did you, was it a vehicle? Was it a bicycle? Um, those sorts of things. And that gives a different message to patients and families that we're actually prioritizing these lifestyle or health promotion interventions. And it makes an opportunity to talk a little outside the box about when we're talking about nature or outdoors or commuting, what are your thoughts about the climate? Is that something that's been on your mind as an entree into potentially screening for climate anxiety or those kinds of concerns? I'm going to skip integrative approaches because that's what the next slide is about. So I'll go to climate anxiety review of systems. We all know about the review of systems and we use it in other ways. So when I'm talking with families, I sometimes will include it by framing through epigenetics. Uh, we know our genes don't determine everything. We used to maybe think that that was the whole story, but now we know about epigenetics, which is the idea. I'll, I'll use a metaphor I borrowed from a mentor that we all have a full set of 88 keys on the piano. Well, most of us do. I guess you could say they're chromosomal differences, but most of us have about the same 88 keys, but we can play all different sorts of songs and musical styles, which is going to be influenced by your environment, by the culture you're in, by the music you're brought up listening to, by the sounds around you, by your own sort of internal soulful interests. And so when thinking about what is the environment that's impacting the music that a person plays, what is affecting the genes that you have and the way that they'll be expressed, we can ask some climate related questions that don't have to be labeled as such. So I can say, tell me something about what are the things that you think are helping your genes to be expressed in healthy ways? What are the things that might be harmful? And then I might ask more specific questions like, you have exposure to smoke or fumes in your environment. It could be cigarette smoke. It could be cannabis. It could be from wildfires. It could be vehicle exhaust from cars or boats or other vehicles. I can ask, what is your diet like? Does it contain a lot of processed foods or whole foods or fruits and vegetables? Does it contain local foods or are most of them shipped from further away? What is your nature exposure like? What's your nearest park or green space? How often do you get to be outside? What might be the barriers or facilitators? Do you live with plants and animals? And are there dangerous items in your house that could include screening for gun safety, but also for chemicals or extra medications? So there are a lot of questions that might overlap with social determinants of health or safety review of systems that we can include in a sort of climate-oriented review of systems to help people talk about it and think about these things as big impacts on their health. I wanted to highlight Tell-Out. We're kind of doing that right now, or tele-learning at least. Um, this is, and so in the field of psychiatry, there's a lot of good data that we can provide a lot of our interventions, not all of them, but I'd say many to most effectively via telehealth. So thinking through your visit list, because that's saving emission, carbon emit, the carbon footprint of just getting to and from a clinic. And if you're at the academic center at UVM, people tend to come from further afield. So there's even bigger savings at tertiary care centers when they look at how far people travel and how much it costs the environment to get back and forth. Um, so a lot of effective care, plus it may increase access and equitable care, um, convenience for patients and lower costs. So a lot of good pieces to telehealth. And I wanted to give you one website to follow up on as well, migratedoctor.org. It's practice oriented and it goes everything from um, 
setting the thermostat and turning off the lights and recycling and composting, um, trying to make a practice more climate friendly and efficient, the kind of foods and uh, healthy foods that are available. You can get a certificate, which also demonstrates when patients and families see it on the wall, we're interested in this, we're climate interested or climate friendly, you can bring up those concerns here. So it's a nice um, practice supportive website to go if you want to start making. And it's kind of the small changes. It's not you know changing the global temperature, but it is maybe keeping the thermostat set at a reasonable temperature when we're not there so that we're saving some energy and contributing. The next slide. So the last piece I wanted to come back to where this is an integrative approach. And this is just a different way of framing what Christine was discussing before. So we know there are a lot of effective integrative or lifestyle or health promotion interventions. We made this into a worksheet to use in our clinic so that we can have parents and caregivers and kids fill it out either together or separately, thinking about family lifestyle interventions. So we've listed a number of areas that have evidence. And this is particularly for kids and adolescents in my practice, um, but many of them will be familiar. We've left the ever-present other because especially teenagers like to say, I don't care about any of those things, but I have another thing that I want to do that's good for my health. So we made space for that. And the middle column is just, what am I doing now? It could be nothing. It could be blank. That's totally fine. And then over to the right, we're looking at what's your priority for doing something different in this area. And here, based on behavior change literature, we're looking for the sevens and above, because that suggests a high likelihood that people will actually act on the change. So out of this, and in the actual worksheet at the bottom, there's room to write a goal, a SMART goal, specific and measurable and so forth. So we're looking for maybe one goal. Two would be great, but that's like icing on the cake. One goal to work on at one time in any of these areas for any family member, really. It doesn't even have to be the identified patient because, again, we're thinking about family systems and setting a specific and measurable goal. And the next slide tells a little bit more about why. So I, I focus this on adolescent depression because it's one of the better studied areas and it's a very common disorder and it can have lifelong consequences, especially in terms of disability adjusted um, loss of quality of life. And so I've looked at studies that um, are pretty high level. So looking at meta-analyses, so a, a good uh, amount of research behind them for some of these interventions compared to what we might call standard psychiatry or child psychiatry as usual, starting up with movement. This is focused on physical activity and the effect size. So a quick reminder, some, uh, small effect sizes are like 0.2 to 0.5. 0.5 to 0.8 is medium, and then above 0.8 would be large. So pretty solid medium effect size for the effect of physical activity on adolescent depression, reducing symptoms. This is from a 2022 meta-analysis um, in child and adolescent psychiatry and mental health, 0.64. If you look at self-compassion interventions, that's the next one, 0.5 across multiple interventions. That's a pooled effect size for depression. And just to note for anxiety, it's 0.49. So very close for those two common and interacting disorders. So pretty good medium effect size. The next one goes down to interventions related to sleep, where shorter sleep just by duration doubles the risk of a decrease in positive affect, almost double the risk of angry affects, and 1.62 times the risk of depression itself. A nutrition intervention, pretty straightforward, fruits and vegetables, uh, low red meats, um, high in fish and healthy fats and nuts. Um, the effect size was 0.5 for adolescent depression, still in that medium range. Mindfulness-based interventions added to traditional therapies get you to 0.46. If you do an actual mindfulness-focused cognitive therapy, MBCT, 0.76 is the effect size. And if you compare it to active controls, it goes down to 0.47, which is still pretty decent. But think about what do we compare medication interventions to? Nothing. We compare them to placebo. You've only got to be better than nothing. So being compared to an active control where you're actually giving something that you think will be helpful for depression and still having a medium effect size, I think is pretty strong. Our traditional interventions of psychotherapy, and this is across like cognitive behavioral, acceptance and commitment, dialectical behavioral, various evidence-based therapies is about 0.55 for adolescents. Good, safe interventions to do. It's a little smaller for pre-adolescents for various possible reasons, but still in the uh, small to medium effect size disappointingly, or maybe helpfully, antidepressant medications in a 2022 meta-analysis for adolescent depression, the effect size overall was 0.12. And I think we actually don't advertise this enough. When we think of adolescent depression, we think of antidepressants, but I think we really shouldn't, not first at least, or not alone. And it, it, there is a high placebo response in um, antidepressant trials. So if you take out the studies with low placebo response, it goes up to a 
rather unimpressive 0.19. So I like having these all on the same page. I don't, I haven't given this to families yet, but for um, information and learning about it, there's a lot of strong effect sizes to be had for the same diagnostic entity, adolescent depression, that have no side effects, either for the humans or for the environment, compared to antidepressants, which have smaller effect sizes and a significant risk of serious side effects for humans and the environment. So a little bit of food for thought, and I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andy. I think we're going to switch. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, Dr. Rand, I believe, is going to share his screen now. OK, yes, uh, let me do that. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, you're all set. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so nice to be here. Um, Andy is a tough act to follow. Um, so I, I, you know, it's so I'm I'm an internal medicine hospitalist, oncology hospitalist, and I'm also actually part of your department as well because I uh, am also a palliative care um, doctor. So actually, this week is my palliative care week, so I'm joining your department in more than one way. Uh, other than Grand Rounds today. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about medical education and how to integrate climate change into medical education. Um, and I'll say that um, as an academic medical center, we certainly have a special obligation, um, both because of all, all of the waste that we generate uh, as a tertiary care facility, but also because we are empowered uh, to teach the next generation of um, healthcare providers of all sorts. Um, and I'll note that uh, many of you are familiar with the AAMC's um, journal Academic Medicine, which is kind of like the most prestigious, um, I would say, journal in academic medicine. And it's, you know, they've been calling or editorialists have been calling for increased attention to climate change in medical education um, for quite a long time, since 2009. And it seems like we're finally gaining some traction um, and looking into how we can do this better. Um, so some people have divided the idea of climate change met it into five different categories, which I'll outline briefly. And then I'm hoping just to give some concrete examples of ways that you can talk about climate change with your learners, whoever they may be. Um, and frankly, there are, are unfortunately an, an infinite number of ways that um, climate change impacts health and how you can, can how you can connect these, but this is just a starting point. Um, so some of these categories include, and I'll start with the bottom first, which is advocacy. Um, and I'll, I'll note that in Vermont, um, some of you are members of VT, uh, CHA, the Vermont Climate and Health Alliance. Um, which is a group of um, all types of medical providers in Vermont. And we've done lots of lobbying at the state house. And I encourage you to check out uh, VTCHA. Um, and then some people talk about how we teach climate change on patient pathology, epidemiology, and how patients present. And this is probably the most straightforward um, and comfortable for those of us who are clinicians. We talk about health systems and how climate change impacts um, healthcare delivery directly. Um, how do we adapt our clinical practice to climate change and then the environment in general and health? Um, so with regard to infrastructure, um, we are familiar with the fact that our medication uh, supply chain is been quite fragile. Certainly COVID uh, reminds us of that. And, and climate change is, is, a, is a big piece of this as well. Um, so this is just a descriptor of, of a Pfizer uh, plant um, that was disrupted from a tornado. And we know that uh, as uh, the climate changes, we are faced with many, many more severe storms. Um, also of note regarding infrastructure, as Andy alluded to, um, many of our pharmaceuticals are made in India, uh, predominantly using coal as fuel. 
And so this presents um, an opportunity both for us to push for more green energy um, and also again to consider the impact of pharmaceuticals on uh, climate change. Um, this is another concrete example of how you can teach your learners to teach patients. So, you know, wildfire smoke, we, we are all familiar with now from this summer. And um, one thing many of us do not know is that um, we talk about wearing masks, but actually the only proven masks that are helpful to decrease particular exposure are N95 or P100 masks. Um, and so, the, so surgical masks just don't, don't do anything. Um, and patients don't know this. Um, another new phenomena is um, heat-triggered renal disease. This is sometimes referred as CKDU, U meaning um, unknown, um, though it is known, and it, it has to do with um, repeated insults associated with farm workers who are uh, toiling in really hot temperatures with limited uh, water intake and they get repeated acute kidney injuries. And um, there's an epidemic of um, end stage renal disease among very young workers, people in their 20s and 30s. Um, unfortunately, many of these, uh, these workers live in um, low resource settings where there's certainly no dialysis available. And um, this is um, a huge issue in um, places where they farm things like sugar cane. Um, another piece to talk about is the cardiovascular impacts of climate change. Um, I just selected um, an interesting article um, from um, South Korea. And what's interesting is looking at, this is measuring PM10 concentrations and noting that um, bradycardia increases dramatically um, as your PM10 concentration increases as your, as your particular size increases. Um, so huge issue. And then I want to finally talk about mental illness and heat. Um, this is um, a study which looked at um, heat in Italy, actually. And um, it's a forest plot. And they compared um, the odds ratio of dying um, based on individual comorbidities. And they looked at um, comparing uh, a baseline temperature of 68 degrees to a higher temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And as you can clearly tell, um, depression and psychosis increase the odds ratio of dying um, very, very significantly. Um, so this is just the beginning, but a couple highlights of how to integrate um, climate change education with your learners um, with some very, very common conditions that we all see um, on a regular basis. And I'm gonna pass this back to Christine. Thanks so much, Dr. Rand. Really appreciate having you here and the evidence that you're sharing with us. Um, I'm going to ask David, if you could stop sharing your screen and we're going to um, invite Megan Melgeri on to speak with us now. Hi everyone. Good thank morning. you for inviting me to be part of this panel and thank you all for your wonderful um, presentation so far. I um, value being part of this um, group here. And um, it's nice to see some of you virtually. <laughs> um, I've spoken with you a bunch of times, so I'm gonna keep it kind of short and let other voices um, speak to this too. But um, in terms of the first question that Christine asked, the need that I can see in this area, climate change and health, I would say the the main needs that I see would be one is um, voices like ourselves, where we are in a position of, you know, trusted translators of science, a position of power, having our degrees, um, that we need to use our voice um, to speak about what we know, which is that climate change is impacting patients' health and that you know, basically that this is unacceptable, that, um, that, you know, we have these big fossil fuel <laughs> companies that are polluting into our air and causing patients harm. Um, so that's a need that I see is having a voice of kind of, I guess, for lack of a better word, advocacy to the issue. 
Um, and then the second issue I really see a need for is to kind of educate and prepare our patients because they are not um, resilient to the changes that we see in health, especially in Vermont, because we live in a cooler climate state. And so patients are uh, not prepared. They often, you know, don't have some of the adaptions that are kind of necessary to endure the heat, endure the stressors that our changing climate puts on their health. And so those are the two kind of needs that I see in terms of what we as clinicians could provide in terms of the way that I, um, the way that I kind of um, see talking to patients about this. Um, I do really believe that we can do it and that we should do it. And I believe that you have the skills and ability to do so. I also find in my own practice, it doesn't take any more time than um, just kind of, you know, just slip it. You basically are able to talk about it um, in the setting of um, medical issues. And uh, it's a nice way to prepare your patients for changes that they might see. So I did want to spend a few minutes just giving you some examples of what I do and um, based on the learning I've had on this topic. Um, so, um, and the reason I believe it's important is because, um, well, we, we are translators of science um, and because, you know, if we believe that climate change is happening, which we know that it is because there's consensus data on this. And if we believe that it's one of the greatest public health threats of our time, uh, which I believe most of us do, um, then I, I think that it's important to speak about it. And the reason why is because um, as healthcare providers and particularly in family medicine, uh, in primary care, we don't shy away from difficult issues when it pertains to people's health. Um, and examples I can think of are, um, gun control, gun, you know, gun safety, storage in your home, uh, domestic violence. We ask questions about um, what's happening in people's homes. We don't shy away from that. And we don't shy away from asking about abortion and other topics like that. So this is another issue where this is clearly impacting people's health and where we shouldn't shy away from feeling free to say what the data says, um, which is that climate change is impacting our patients' health now. Um, so examples of what I say is basically, for example, if I'm in a physical, I might say, um, you know, because of the changing climate or because of the warming climate, I want you to be prepared. And, um, you know, you're on uh, these medicines here, and these are the couple that make you more susceptible to the, you know, heat related impacts, for example, a diuretic, any blood pressure medication. Um, SSRIs, antipsychotics, those type of um, pharmaceuticals will make you more, more susceptible. So I want to make sure that you're prepared. Um, you're not the person I want going mowing the lawn at noon on July 4th. Um, so that would be one example. Another example is a physical is a nice time to talk about prevention and preparation. So I'll say, you know, if and when you go out in the woods, make sure you're wearing long pants, make sure you're um, wearing long sleeves and a hat um, because of the warming climate. We have more and more cases of Lyme disease and this is not something you wanna get. If we can prevent it by having long sleeves, wearing DEET, you know, let's do so. Um, when people come to me with some symptoms that seem consistent with allergies, I just use as an opportunity to say, um, allergies are on the rise because of the warming climate. There's actually, there was a National Academy of Sciences paper in 2021, I believe, that indicated that allergies are uh, 21 percent rise in allergies uh, since 1990. So you can say to people, you know, allergies are on the rise because of the warming climate. You know, it does seem like you might. You know, it's not unusual that you would have. You know, even though I know you've never had allergies before, this is not uncommon. Or you know, allergies when people are allergy sufferers, they're more likely to have more severe symptoms because with carbon dioxide, with a longer growing season, with warmer temperatures. It's just the conditions for this to be worse. Um, and actually that same study from 2021, I believe, was uh, indicating that pollen is actually more potent in addition. So many, many causes for that. And that's not just for allergy sufferers. You think about allergies triggering asthma, triggering, you know, being an exacerbator for COPD, 
Um, so in the clinic and where I find it's really easy to talk about this issue is with any respiratory issue, of course, because our patients kind of come to us and they, you know, if you ask them, they know, they knew when air quality days were poor. Um, they know when it's really hot and humid, when it's like, you know, above 87 degrees. I actually had a patient this summer who hadn't gone out of her home since she was admitted to the hospital with COPD ex exacerbation doing that kind of like June weather. So not only had she been, you know, exacerbated by the poor air quality and gone to the hospital with COPD exacerbation, but she coming home was scared to go outside. Um, so, I mean, it had been three weeks and I visited her in her home. And uh, so these, these issues impact people and I think it's important to talk about it. Um, but thank you and I'll pass it on to the next person. Thank you so much, Dr. Melgiri. And um, last but certainly not least, Dr. Dittis, I will share my screen again to pull up your slides here. All right. Um... Yeah, so I, um, uh, the first, um, you can see my bias right there, I guess. Um, I do um, think it's important to uh, mention that at least right now in um, the world of cancer, we're not seeing an uptick in cancer related um, diagnoses related to the climate. But I think there's a real potential for that, especially when you think about the carcinogens such as formaldehyde and benzene that are released in um, uh, the wildfire smoke. And then there's the particulate matter, which is likely a concern for lung cancer as well, but it takes a while for cancer to develop. Um, so we're not seeing an uptick yet. Um, and then uh, another thing related to this is that many cancers are related to inactivity and food choice and climate change may make it more difficult to move. I think that we just had a perfect example of that and also may modify our access to um, fresh fruits and vegetables. But right now in terms of um, cancer and planetary health related things, my biggest um, planetary health concern has to do with our um, current food system and the consumption of ultra processed foods, which contribute both to the destruction of the environment and also it's hijacking our health. So that is my biggest concern. So, um, uh, uh, next slide, our um, food system accounts for one third of greenhouse emissions, but that's only part of the story. It is a primary driver of soil loss and degradation, use of uh, chemicals, a rainforest destruction and dying oceans. But, um, and you can see the complexity of the food system there, but the food system with all its complexity really also offers an opportunity to reduce and draw down greenhouse gas emissions to restore soil and um, diversity, both within the soil and animal diversity, and as well as uh, helping to restore community. So I think of it as a keystone solution. So what sort of things can healthcare do in terms of improving the outcomes for both um, patients and the climate in this regard? So um, healthcare providers are really always working on that consumer end of um, that um, uh, scale there. We do that every day. So I wanna talk a little bit about some uh, uh, interventions that are going on related to the University of Vermont Medical Center. Next slide. So first of all, I wanna point out that person in the bottom, that's Diane Emery, and she's the Director of Nutrition Services and um, has been a, um, uh, leader in um, helping us move towards a more sustainable healthcare system. And she um, is the director of nutrition services, as you can see, but she's also the new network director of sustainability at the University of Vermont uh, Health Network. So I think that is really says a lot for what she's done, but also um, how University of Vermont Medical Center does um, uh, uh, see this as an important aspect to consider. So in terms of some of the direct patient activities that are going on, one of them is Farm Shares for Health. And Farm Shares for Health is a way, it is essentially a produce prescription program and it provides CSA boxes. So uh, plenty of vegetables and fruit to patients in various locations um, during uh, the growing season. It was started by Alicia Jacobs at, out at Colchester Family Practice and Diane 13 years ago. So this has been going on for a long time. It was reformatted um, during COVID. And for the last two years, 
uh, uh, these CSA boxes have been provided to individuals at the Comprehensive Pain Program. And this year, um, uh, the Comprehensive Pain Program and um, the University of Vermont um, Cancer Center. And the focus is on individuals with food insecurity. So that's an awesome program. And then there are several gardening opportunities. So the rooftop top gardens have been around for um, many years, about 10 years, and serves to educate patients and staff. And then in the last couple of years, there's been a gardening for health program that um, was started in 2020 by Michael Latrell in primary care and internal medicine, as well as Diane Emery. And um, patients had an opportunity to learn how to grow and use their own food. And this was a collaboration uh, with Michael, but also um, with um, uh, Diane and our garden educator. So many of you might not know that we have a garden educator associated with the University of Vermont Medical Center. And then there's a learning garden at Fannie Allen. And then I want to really point out also the group medical visits that Whitney Calkins has been doing for many years as well. And um, the name of her um, uh, a group medical, medical visit is Skills Before Pills, and she has data on how useful it is. And it really focuses on promoting lifestyle change and, of course, on food. So every, every session has a focus on food. And um, Whitney runs this with a registered dietitian um, that um, uh, Diane Emery um, uh, arranged uh, for her to um, work with. And um, Mike Latrell um, and I both have done some group medical visits as well that um, focus on um, lifestyle change uh, with an emphasis on food. And then um, on the other side of the um, slide, I think uh, as was pointed out, it's really healthcare and healthcare delivery can be uh, impactful on the environment. And so, um, some ways that that has been um, uh, modified here at the University of Vermont Medical Center is by composting. Actually, um, uh, the Nutrition Services has been co composting since 1995, so that's a long time. Our meat utilization is um, in the uh, lower percentile for healthcare um, uh, nutrition services, and 90% of our meat is locally sourced. And there are other locally sourced options. And there um, is our um, uh, participation in Lean Path as a way to measure food waste, which also has a major contribution to um, uh, uh, gas, greenhouse gas emissions and tracking greenhouse gas emissions related to the University of Vermont Medical Center's food service. And um, I um, uh, hear from um, Diane uh, Emery that reusable containers are coming. So another way uh, that um, uh, we are um, leading um, in this area. And then sort of finally, um, uh, the last question was, how do I talk about climate change with patients? And um, first of all, I think it's really important to meet people where they are. And so I really love that table that um, Andy had. And I think I'm going to steal it because I, I think it's really important to meet people where they're, they are at and what they're most interested in. After a cancer um, uh, diagnosis, after initial treatment, that's a very teachable moment and people are often wanting to know what they can do to prevent cancer from coming back or preventing a recurrence. So that's an opportunity that I have um, to talk about food and movement on a regular um, basis. And so I frequently do and you know, point out the fact that uh, those lifestyle changes that can help prevent cancer and cancer recurrence are also better um, for the planet. Thank you so much, Dr. Dennis. Really appreciate your time with us as well today. Um, we have just a few minutes left for some questions from our audience. And um, I'm going to just pose this here. Um, what are you seeing? What questions do you have? What role do you see healthcare playing in this connection? How do you talk about climate change with patients? And uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. I'm seeing um, Dr. Anderson. Did you have your hand up? Maybe not. Let me check the chat too. Oh, looks like we're just getting some great kudos for 
Diane Emery in particular, uh, thank you so much for all the service that you have done over so many years. And congratulations again to Diane for um, her new role as the director for the entire health network for sustainability. And thanks to her for all the work that she will continue to do. We look forward to continuing to hold relationships together and, and finding things that we can do together. Well, seeing no questions, thank you everyone um, for joining us. And if you have further questions, please feel free to contact any of us. We're very willing to um, help promote these topics and help find ways forward that we can all work together. So thank you for your time this morning. Thanks for our panelists. Yes, thank you all of you for uh, your contributions to the panel discussion this morning. I, I just kept wanting to screenshot all the slides and then I remembered they are going to be on the Integrative Health website so I can uh, go back and look at things at my leisure and so can all of you. So um, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thanks for having us.